Hello, my name is Konstantinos Hadzilgeroulis and I'm adjunct lecturer in the University of Patras, Greece. Hello, I'm Jean-Baptiste Mouret. I'm a senior researcher at Teneria in France. So the key question of this talk would be how to adapt to new situations, uh, with, especially with try and your learning algorithms. So the kind of problems we want to solve are like this. We have a leg robot, for instance, that can work. It works nicely, no problem. And then something bad happens, something breaks. So in that case, we remove one wire. And the robot cannot work anymore, and it needs to recover its capability by being able to find a way to work again. So we want to use learning for this. And of course, learning uh, has seen a lot of successes in the last years. Uh, for instance, now we can learn to play Atari games from pixels, which is a very impressive achievement. We can also have algorithms that can beat the world champion at Go. All are very impressive achievements. But if we look into this in details, then we see that we need a lot of training time. So for instance, for the original Atari paper, uh, it was about 36 days of play for training, uh, which is much too much for a robot. Uh, and for the Go, it was about 5 million games. So of course, this can be reduced, but essentially the idea is that we cannot afford this kind of thing on a robot, even a few days. Imagine we have a robot uh, on the field and something breaks. You don't want to wait for 30 days so that it can find a way to uh, work again. So the way uh, we see it is that we have um, this spectrum of the amount of data. So on the left, you have the big data world. Uh, so like Go, Atari games, and most of the deep reinforcement learning stuff that happen in simulation. Uh, it works nicely, but it assumes that you have access to almost unlimited computation. Uh, but on the right, we have what we can actually do on robots. On a robot, you can essentially do something like one to 20 trials. That's already a lot, 20 trials to do something like opening a door, do something like this. That means that we want algorithms that can learn in a few minutes. And I call this as a micro data world. And question in this talk would be, what can we do when we want to learn in this micro data world? Can we still learn something and um, then apply this on a robot? So the main hypothesis that we have in this kind of work is that we want to minimize the interaction time with the system. That's the only thing that really matters. Uh, we consider that computation or pre-computation is essentially free. So we can spend as much time as we want in pre-computation and possibly in computation, but we want to interact with the system with as little time as possible. So the question here, how can we learn with that little data? So here are how we see it, and we recently wrote everything about this in a big uh, survey paper uh, which was published last year. So <clears throat> if we look at uh, the robot, it's, uh, it's a system that has some dynamics, so possibly probabilistic, which is the top left uh, of this uh, drawing. And with these dynamics, we want to control it with a policy. So the dynamics is uh, how given the current state and the current action, what will be the next state. The policy will look at the current state and decide for an action, could be probabilistic or deterministic. And then from this, we can ex extract uh, some returns, so some reward. And what we ultimately want is to maximize the expected return. So the policy is typically something that is parameterized by a set of parameters like theta, could be a neural network, so something uh, open, or could be a very specialized policy. In all these cases, uh, what we want is to find the theta that will maximize the expected return um, for the robot. So how can we make things much more data efficient than just uh, using this? There are two main ideas. First one is to use models. So if you have a model, you can make prediction and you can use the model instead of the real system. So basically learn some kind of simulator. So you can make a model of the dynamics, which will correspond to a simulator, or you can learn a model directly of uh, the expected return, which will correspond to bias optimization. That means that given some parameters, you can already predict if this, what would be the performance, so if these parameters will work nice or not. But to make things even faster, you need priors. And there are different sources of priors. So on the dynamics, you can have priors on dynamics, like already have a model of the robot. You can have a prior on the structure of the policy. So if you choose your structure well, then learning is much easier. For instance, if you have dynamic movement primitives that can 
encode very complex motions with just a few parameters. We can also have priors on parameters. Uh, usually there are demonstrations, but maybe you already know something about what are possibly good parameters. And we'll see that we can have priors on expected return. So in nature, most of this come from uh, evolution and experience. In computers, all these priors can come from known models of a system, also from meta-learning, generic knowledge, and we'll see examples of this. So in this talk, we'll uh, address mostly priors and models for the dynamics and priors and models uh, for the expected return. So let's start with uh, dynamics. So let's start with models and priors on the dynamics. So the first thing we need to do when we have to model a, a system is to define what the dynamical model is. So we have a system of our state X and at each time step, we apply an action U and we define the model of the system <coughs> at its time step as a combination of the current state and a function that takes input the current state and the action that we choose that gets us to the next state xt plus one. Of course, in real system we do have some noise and we can model this uh, with uh, uh, some parameter. So the objective is here to, uh, given some data that we have collected from the real system, uh, to be able to uh, learn a model uh, of the function f so that we can uh, extrapolate and predict uh, new points that we haven't seen uh, in order to use this model like a simulator. <clears throat> this is a classical regression problem and we can try to use any uh, classical supervised learning uh, algorithm. So the first thing that comes to mind is to use neural networks and uh, of course we can use them uh, but the main issue is that typically uh, neural networks require a lot of data and this is exactly the opposite of what we want because we want adaptation that can work well with very little data. Also another important thing is that when we have a, a very little data, uh, we would like to predict uncertainty because that way we can uh, more easily avoid overfitting. Uh, a very good tool for this is Gaussian processes <clears throat> and we will not mention a lot of details, uh, but uh, they capture nicely, very nicely uh, the uncertainty. And also they can be described very compactly in mathematics. All the equations that we need are in the, uh, in the graph on the right. Uh, and uh, uh, they fit very well our problem that we want to learn with very little data and provide also some certainty. So how can we use this for model-based reinforcement learning? <clears throat> we took inspiration from uh, the PILCO algorithm and we recently developed uh, an algorithm called Blackdrops that uh, operates in four steps. So the first step is to perform a few random trials where we collect new data from the system using uh, a random policy or uh, some random uh, actions. Uh, with the data, we learn uh, a probabilistic model of the dynamics of the robot and the system with custom processes. <clears throat> and then we use uh, an algorithm called CMIS to optimize the poli a policy given the model. And we do this by sampling the Gaussian process model, the probabilistic model that we have. And basically what we do, we treat each rollout uh, as a one function evaluation of a noisy function. And CMIS uh, uh, basically is, is developed to be able to handle uh, noisy evaluations. And also uh, because of, uh, of the population-based scheme that it uses, it can benefit a lot from parallelization, uh, so we can get uh, very good speed ups. So once we have this new policy that we have optimized on the model, we try it on the robot, we collect more data, and we go back to step two. We learn a new model with all the new data. We optimize again with CMIS, and we continue this process. <clears throat> so with this uh, type of algorithms, we are able to learn from scratch in very uh, few episodes, like four or five episodes, or like 20, 30 seconds of interaction time in simple systems like the card pole or the double card pole and the pendulum. And basically the main uh, message here is that we can be as effective as PILCO, but using this population-based algorithm, we can have a uh, faster uh, runtime of the algorithm. So the main issue of uh, this type of approach is like PILCO and black drops and uh, approaches like this, is that they do not scale very well uh, when the, when the the dimensions of the uh, of the system of the dynamical model are very high, and this is because we need exponentially more data to actually capture uh, the effects of the dynamics. 
So <clears throat> as we have said before, one of the best ways to be able to learn more effectively uh, in high dimensional system is to use more primes. So uh, fortunately, Gaussian processes provide a very nice way to insert priors in the, uh, in the system. And we can do this, one way of doing this is through the mean function of the GP. So by default, Gaussian process assume a zero function, a zero mean function, which means that uh, we predict uh, basically that the state doesn't change in the dynamical model as we have described it before. But uh, we don't necessarily have to stick to this. And here we have an example where we have exactly the same data. And by changing the mean function, we get completely different shapes uh, as predictions. So the idea here is to use uh, a simulator, uh, a full featured simulator, uh, as a mean function for the GP. Uh, and we recently tried this uh, in our work where we basically use this simulator as a prior. And then we use Gaussian process to learn uh, the difference between the simulator, what the simulator gives us, and what we see from the real system. Uh, we also took it one step uh, ahead, and we also try, uh, we say that <clears throat> a simulator can also have some parameters uh, that uh, we can change, for example, the length of the leg, of its leg of the robot, or maybe some masses, or maybe some friction, uh, coefficient of frictions, and stuff like that, that could affect the behavior. And we can uh, basically learn them uh, from the real data. This is very close to, model, to classical model identification. So basically, in this paper, what we do is that we define a way to maximize the likelihood of this combined model that we have the simulator with the parameters and the Gaussian process that learns the difference. And we're able to find the parameters for both, the hyperparameters of both. And we effectively combine uh, non-parametric model learning and model identification. And the idea here in the intuition is that whatever can be captured by the by the tunable simulator uh, will make the learning for the GP easier, so we can exploit it. Uh, whereas we capture with the GP whatever cannot uh, whatever the simulator cannot capture. Uh, <coughs> so, for example, uh, in this robot, we remove the the back leg, and of course, it cannot really walk. Uh, so we collect the data, we learn the model, and yeah. Beginning from the second episode, we can already learn a policy that can uh, do some uh, work a bit. And from the third episode, it already starts to, uh, to work quite nicely. And from the fourth, fifth episode, we begin to have a very nice policy that uh, can work quite well. Uh, here, we use a policy that has 36 parameters. So we have also a good structure in the policy. Uh, but of course, one could use uh, uh, more uh, uh, more generic policies and the pipeline still works. So here we can see that we can learn in uh, a few seconds of interaction, very few seconds of interaction, we can learn very, very nice gates using this type of, uh, uh, of algorithms. Uh, Gaussian processes are nice, <clears throat> but they tend to be slow and they're slow both in training, they require about O and cube, uh, what is the number of samples, uh, but also in training, we also have to uh, uh, optimize for the hyperparameters, which is a difficult optimization problem and can take some time. But most importantly, they're also uh, slow in query time. So we, they require about O n square. Uh, and this means that we, uh, we cannot use uh, GPs, uh, pure GPs uh, for dynamical systems that are complex and high dimensional or for longer experiments where we will require a lot of data to, uh, to handle. Another thing that uh, uh, GPs uh, fail to, uh, to fulfill is the fact that uh, if we have a model, do we really need a policy? And uh, if we think about it, we can use other types of, uh, <coughs> uh, of ideas like model predictive control, where we can use the model and define at its time step a small optimization problem uh, in order to optimize for the optimal actions in a smaller horizon, like uh, uh, half, half or one second. Uh, but because this optimization runs at its time step, we require a very fast model. <clears throat> so GPs there would fail to suit, the, uh, fail to suit the, this problem uh, well, because they're, as we said, a bit slow. Uh, so neural networks are making fast progress in, uh, in catching up in the uh, properties of GPs for good extrapolation and nice uh, uh, 
uh, and predicting uncertainty, for example, with assembles and uh, similar stuff with Bayes and Redox, et cetera. Also, they, use, they, <clears throat> they tend to work very well with GPUs and embedded chips, so there might be a, a better solution for uh, usage in robotics. So how can we use uh, neural networks to uh, learn uh, a dynamics model and make it that efficient? One idea is to use meta-learning. Uh, so the idea is that we uh, use simulation and meta-learn <coughs> uh, uh, a policy, uh, a model with uh, a lot of example situations, for example, different types of damages or different types of terrains, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea then is that uh, online, uh, we can adapt this uh, meta-learned model with only a few gradient steps. And this is one way of inserting uh, a prior into our dynamics model so that, we, <coughs> uh, so that we can actually use the simulation to produce a nice prior. Uh, the, the most popular algorithm for doing meta-learning is uh, MAML. And here the idea is that uh, we, find, we find one good initial point from which uh, we can optimize only with a few gradient steps uh, to get to many different situations, the ones that we have seen in uh, example situation simulation. So the idea is that in the end, uh, MAML will give us uh, a good initial starting point for the policy that we can only optimize for a few uh, gradient steps and get uh, to, a good, uh, to a good solution given the data that we have in the online adaptation. So in a recent paper, <coughs> uh, uh, we tried to extend this idea. And instead of starting like MAML from a single starting point, uh, we meta learn many starting points. And the idea is that uh, online, we will uh, choose the most likely uh, one and train this to adapt to the damage of the new situation. Uh, so the idea is, the, is similar. So we uh, use the simulation to uh, meta learn a dynamical model for uh, uh, multiple types of damages and terrains and situations. And then instead of uh, keeping only one starting point, we have many. So online, we uh, choose the most likely one, and then we adapt to the situation that uh, seems to be the most uh, uh, likely one. Here also, we didn't use a policy. We used a sampling-based uh, modulative control <laughs> to control the robot. And we can see an example here with a, with a quadruped. Uh, on the left, we see uh, the uh, without adaptation. On the right, with adaptation in this simple quadruped robot. And we can see that uh, very quickly, the, pol the pipeline uh, is able to adapt to uh, the data that it sees and provide uh, a much better uh, performance than not non-adapting. We also uh, uh, implemented this in, in many different systems and in a real robot. Thank you. So now let's move to <clears throat> models of the expected return and what we can do with Bayesian optimization and priors on Bayesian optimization. So starting point is that modeling the, the dynamics works very well in simple systems. Uh, one nice thing is that it does not depend on the dimensionality of the policy, but it's very hard to learn a model even with a prior. And one of the main reasons is that it does not scale when the dimension of the state space increases. So if you have a bigger state space, you need essentially exponentially more data point to cover it. And very quickly, it becomes very hard to learn. So, but in some cases, the state space is very large, but the policy is actually very simple. So we can think about things like uh, insert like uh, reactive strategies. You have uh, the world, which is high dimensional, very, very complex, but still sometimes just to avoid obstacles, you don't need all of this. You don't need to understand all the dynamics of the world. You just need to have a very basic reflex to avoid obstacles. So if you have a simple policy with just a few parameters, you can use Bayesian optimization. So the general idea is that we use a Gaussian process to model the objective. So given the current parameters, what is the expected return? And we can still use uh, <coughs> priors as a mean function. So for instance, if you have an idea about the expected performance. So the general algorithm looks like this. We start with a few random points. We learn the Gaussian process to make predictions about the, <coughs> given the parameters, what will be the expected value. Then we use the model to select the most interesting point to try next, and we'll see in the next slide how to do it. 
Uh, we evaluate the function at byte points, that means that we try it on the real system, on the robot. We update the model with the new data point, and then we loop like this. So the main question in Bayesian optimization is what is the most interesting point, what's the next thing to try? So there are two main ideas in the literature. Um, the essentially expected improvement, which is to look at what is the best solution that we have found so far, and how much we can gain from this. Uh, there is a close form from this uh, for Gaussian processes, but it's a bit complicated to write here, but can be done easily. The other one is um, the upper confidence bound, so UCB, which is a bit more intuitive, is that we take the point for, that has a high potential. That means that is a good predicted mean and a good variance, so good uncertainty for this point. So we add the two with some uh, parameter kappa, and with this, we take something which is unknown and potentially good. So if it's a point that is a very unknown, but the mean is low, then we don't take it. And if the point has a very good mean and a very low uncertainty, it's not very interesting because we already know it. So for instance, how to use priors uh, and Bayesian optimization on a simple robot. Here we have a very simple uh, robot, which is made of a total security structure, which is soft with springs. And we have a policy which is made of only three voltages. So <clears throat> one for each of these small motors here, which are actually vibrators. So the goal here is that so that the robot can move is to make the structure vibrate in a way that makes the robot make small steps. So that's a very simple robot. We have external power. And we expect that the fastest gates will involve combination of motors uh, that are moving. So we can put this in the mean function of a GP that will essentially say we expect the performance to be better when motors are moving. But because, of course, if no motors are moving, nothing will move. So that's, that's wrong, because if you make all the motors at full speed, then usually the robot tumbles. Uh, but still, it's a good prior. And if we learn with this, uh, with Bayesian optimization, uh, we can learn uh, something like this. So this is after uh, 30 trials of training. So 30 trials on the real robot, but uh, we only have three parameters to learn. Uh, but still, the, the gate itself is uh, not trivial at all. It's very uh, complicated. All the structure is moving using the vibration. And we can see on the plot that using the prior is key here to, to do much better than a random choice of, of the values of the policy. So here the two keys are we using Bayesian optimization and we're using a prior, which is in that case um, a quite intuitive prior. But uh, of course, it's um, it's not enough if you want to do something on a real robot. Three parameters uh, is a very low number. So how can we use priors for Bayesian optimization and still scale up to complex policies? So we take the same idea as when learning the dynamics. We could use the simulator as a mean function. So if we already know simulator, we can use this, use this as a mean function. But still, this uh, that's usually too high dimensional because remember that in uh, by an optimization, you need to be able to predict the expected performance given the parameters. And if you have more than a dozen of parameters, it becomes, again, very, very hard to learn a good predictor. So in the case of, for example, robot, we have 36 uh, parameters to learn, and that's too many for Bayesian optimization. But if you use a neural network, that might be 1,000, 2,000, 1 million, many more. So to solve this problem, we propose the system based on two steps. So first, in simulation, we have an algorithm which is called MapElitz that searches for many good solutions for walking. So many ways of working, like walking with the body tilt forward, walking with the body tilt backward, uh, and so on. So it, for each of these, so for instance, with the body tilt forward, there is a better one. There is one gate that makes the robot work faster on a straight line, and other gates that makes the robot just uh, turn on itself, for instance. So <clears throat> we search for many of these gates, but we search for, for good gates. And this algorithm uh, will find something like 15,000 uh, good gates for uh, this six slide robot. And then we can do two things with these gates. First, it's like taking all the needles out of our haystack. We have a big haystack with all the possible gates, and we take the needles out, and then we can only search among the needles. So all life will be much easier if we only search among the needles. And also, all these needles will correspond to policies, so we don't really care if they are um, <coughs> neural networks, oscillators, whatever. We're just 
various found solutions. And then we organize all of these solutions into 6D space uh, in that case. So 6D is uh, low dimensional enough so that we can actually learn with Bayesian optimization. So this is what we have here. We start with this broken robot. Remember that we removed uh, one wire. And we try it, we look at the distance covered by the robot. We don't care about the dynamics and so on. And we just make a prediction about what's the next point to try by searching in this six dimensional space that was pre-computed and that contains only good solutions. So <clears throat> here that's the first, uh, first trial. And you see some improvement, but the robot is still not working forward. Uh, and last one, here after uh, five trials, 30 seconds of learning, and here we didn't get any episode, uh, you see that we have learned a nice gain. So we turn one last thing, does not work better. So we stop there and say, okay, we already have a good gate uh, after only 40 seconds of learning on the real system. And that's because that's a combination of Bayesian optimization and a very good prior. And remember that we can compute as many things as we want before if it makes adaptation faster on the real system. Uh, this gate is actually quite nice. Uh, it's dynamic and so on. You can look at this uh, on the video online. We tried this on many systems and it's surprisingly robust. Uh, here it's the same kind of algorithm, but on a, a quadruped robot, we blocked the first leg. And in six episodes of 10 seconds, we found a new gate. On the six leg robot, uh, we try to remove one leg, two legs, cut legs in half, and we can always adapt to good gates in less than two minutes. Uh, that amounts, it's about like uh, 10 to 15 trials. So it's a, it's a very, it's not an optimal gate, it's not an optimal solution, but it's actually a very easy algorithm compared to many of the other approaches and it works surprisingly well. One extension that we did then is say, but maybe we already can anticipate that some damage can occur. So maybe we can say on a six leg robot, so it's likely that we can lose one of the legs. Uh, it's one likely damage. So we can prepare for it by uh, learning this um, gates, so these 15,000 gates for all of these damage conditions. That's, that, for instance, that gives us uh, six uh, maps of 15,000 solutions. And then we can also prepare for a few other things. We can also uh, do the same algorithm, so the pre-computing algorithm several times because it's a stochastic algorithm. So maybe some maps are better than others. And then online, we want to select the most likely prior given the data. But if you simply do this, uh, that does not work very well because the most likely prior when you're broken is usually something very pessimistic. So it's a bit like UCB, you want something with high potential. And the way we did it is to use an acquisition function that maximizes the expected improvement of a solution times the likelihood of the prior. So we want something that is potentially very good and that matches the data well. And with this, uh, we can accelerate learning. Uh, again, it's the same robot, same experiment. We broke one leg. We have a few more parameters here. That's why the gates are a bit different. So we have uh, 54 parameters to learn here, but that does not really change anything. Just that at that time, we were experimenting with more parameters. And <clears throat> you see that two free parameters, uh, two free trials are enough uh, to learn new gates. So three here, and you see the diversity of gates. So we're not, it's true that we are learning uh, in that case, open loop gates. So we're not using neural networks or whatever. Uh, but still, um, <clears throat> we have a very large diversity of gates. And so what is trying crazy stuff. So it's really exploring this interesting space. So I think five tries is enough to learn on this specific case. So here you see a new gate that works in spite of the broken leg, so the missing leg on the back. So to conclude, this talk was about how can we learn by trial and error in a few trials? And we mainly saw two strategies. <clears throat> the first one is learning a dynamical model, which basically corresponds to model-based reinforcement learning. And we saw that uh, it works quite well for, for relatively small state spaces, but does not scale very well with uh, the dimension of the state space. So if you have a big robot, uh, we're going to have some trouble in applying model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, but of course, it scales well with a number of the parameters of the policy because it is somewhat independent in the sense that uh, since we're optimizing the policy on the model, uh, the learning the model and the dynamics does not uh, uh, 
interfere with the number of parameters of the policy. Uh, also a nice uh, feature that uh, model-based reinforcement learning has is that it can generalize to new tasks. So once we have learned a good um, model of the dynamics, <coughs> then uh, we can easily change the task and then learn a new policy given the model. And this way we can uh, more easily generalize the new task. Of course, it's slow online because uh, it's time that we collect new data. We have to relearn re the model and this can take quite some time depending on the exact uh, pipeline that we're using. And also another downside is that learning a good dynamic model is still an open problem, especially when you have unstructured data and not a well-defined static data set. The second uh, strategy was learning uh, a model of the reward. And this is some kind of uh, surrogate-based optimization. Uh, and uh, the good thing about this is that uh, it scales very well to mess with the state space. Basically, it's a bit irrelevant in the sense that it only depends on the parameters and the number of the parameters of the policy. <clears throat> so if we have uh, as if we have a good structure of the policy that is relatively low dimensional, uh, we can uh, optimize this very easily, and we don't care. We do not care about the complexity or the uh, dimensionality of the test space. Of course, this doesn't generalize well to new task because. Uh, when we have to learn a new policy, basically, if the two policies are not uh, somewhat quite related, uh, we have to relearn it from scratch uh, because it's a completely different policy. But this can be relatively fast uh, online because it has uh, not too many computations uh, uh, to compute. So in both cases, we can uh, we should we can and we should use models or simulators as priors because they will, this will make learning more tractable and easier to handle. And for this, we saw that both custom process with mini francs or neural networks and meta learning can work very well. <laughs> so as a, as a more general conclusion, uh, one discussion that is interesting is what is a good and what is a bad prior? And how can we uh, uh, define what we need to do? So in general machine learning, uh, we usually fear the priors because our ultimate objective is to have no prior and let the machine learn by itself. Uh, but for practical algorithms, uh, we need to find flexible ways to insert the priors into the algorithms. And this means that we might need to do some meta learning, use mean functions of the GPs, or some uh, simtorial techniques that we diffuse some priors in some uh, latent space. Uh, or as we saw, maybe we can have a lot of priors, but uh, discard the ones that are not needed, etc., etc. And overall, uh, we feel that uh, there is a gap in the literature here, and that we have a lot of way of new ways to explore to insert correctly the priors in machine learning algorithms. Uh, <clears throat> so simulators can be uh, a relatively good source of prior knowledge because they're generic. So we can simulate a lot of systems. And even if they are imperfect, they can be insanely uh, useful, as we saw in the in the talk. But also, uh, uh, we can uh, intuitively identify that uh, even having an imperfect model can be very nice uh, for many stuff. Uh, but uh, using simulators uh, as a prior for a full dynamical model with contacts and uh, collisions and everything can be a bit hard to uh, do uh, uh, due to practical issues. So the good price would be as generic as possible, but if they're too generic, they're a bit useless because they stop to uh, help us accelerate the learning. And we also need to, uh, to need them to be not task specific uh, because we would like to use it in many different tasks and uh, many generic uh, uses. So overall, there is quite some uh, place here to uh, have new interesting work. So as a more general conclusion, you see th here three columns. Uh, and the main question here is, why do we need learning in the first place? So in the uh, most left column, you see model-based planning and control, which is basically no learning there. Everything is known, and we do either model-based control or planning. And in the far uh, right place, you see the online adaptation, which is learning in a, a known system. So let's take them one by one. So in model based and control, we have a, a fully known system, or at least uh, known in an adequate level so that we can control it or plan it. So the main assumption here is that we have a quite good model and simulator or simulator, uh, because we are using the model or simulator to control our plan. Uh, the data here is that we take the current state, 
And we can also replan or change the control. For example, modability control, we can uh, alter the, uh, the action. And here we uh, basically have zero training because there's nothing to train. And usually, uh, especially for model-based control, uh, this requires a very good computer to run online and fast. Otherwise, we have a, a slow running time. So the main challenges here is our engineering to make the, uh, uh, the optimization that we need to run in real time uh, on, uh, on a robot. So this is speed. And also, uh, if the assumption of the good model does not hold, then we're in trouble because uh, many weird things can happen. So the second column <clears throat> is what uh, most of the literature in uh, reinforcement learning is doing at the moment, at least in our opinion, <clears throat> where we assume that we have a known system because usually you use a model or a simulator or some good idea of what we have to do in the reward function, blah, blah. So we have a relatively known system, but we assume that it, the controller is too complicated to write it by hand. Uh, so we want to learn the controller uh, of this uh, more or less known system. <clears throat> and here the assumption is still a good simulator model, not as strong as the uh, in model-based control and planning. Uh, but if the model is not uh, good enough, then we can have a quite big reality gap between the simulator and the reality. So our policy will not work at all. Uh, here we uh, do not have any online training. So we basically rely on robustness. Uh, to to adapt to new situations. So if our policy is robust to perturbations and different terrains, uh, we can somewhat adapt, uh, but this is what we uh, rely on. So here training is very slow, uh, and we know that uh, reinforcement learning algorithms require a lot of training uh, and a lot of samples to find good solutions. But uh, when we're running it on the robot, on the real system, it's uh, usually very fast because it's just a neural network that can run uh, uh, on the system. So here the main challenge is how can we make more uh, better the training, find better solutions or also faster, but also how to close the reality gap, especially when we have imperfect simulators. So the last column is the one that uh, we are more interested in, and this is online adaptation. So basically here we assume that we have a partially unknown system. So we know a few stuff. For example, we can know the intact robot and we ha can have an approximate model of the intact robot, but we are not aware of the new situation or the damage it can happen, it has or stuff like that. So here we have an imperfect model. We, can, we do not have a, a good model. We don't make this assumption. And <clears throat> when we get the data from the real system, we learn by the data on the real system. So this is not something that we uh, rely on robustness or the planning or the model. Uh, we use the real data to uh, change completely the behavior. So the training can be slow. Uh, and uh, this is uh, because we need to do quite a few computations usually. Uh, but running time can also be quite fast because we still use some kind of a policy or modulative control that we can make it fast. So here, the main challenges are data efficiency. So how can we learn with very few trials? Because as we saw, online adaptation is usually useful when it's fast. And also the dimensionality of the state space of the policy, depending on which exactly uh, type of online adaptation we're using, uh, so that we can do this online and be reasonably fast. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I want to thank all the students and engineers who work on this project. And if you have any questions, please send us an email. Thank you.